we are going to continue with the sermon series we started last week, um, defining moments, how to build a lasting legacy. And before we jump into that, does anybody know what is happening three weeks from today? It is our 50th anniversary. That's exactly right. 50 years. God has been good and faithful to our church. Are you thankful for our church this morning? Man, I am thankful for our church. I'm thankful for God's people. If you have not set these dates aside and these times aside, Saturday night, July 8th, 6 p.m., right here in the auditorium, we are going to be having a special service that night. Brother Walker, our founding pastor, is going to be here. Brother Stewart, who also helped start the church and then pastored for 25 years, he's going to be here. We're going to have a question and answer with them tonight, along with a lot of other special things that Saturday night. It's going to be an awesome night. You're going to be challenged. You don't want to miss it. We're having a dessert reception to follow in the gym. And when I say a dessert reception, I'm talking about it's going to be no joke, a legit dessert reception. Okay, think wedding reception, except it's all desserts, the best thing in the world right there. So uh, just want to make sure you put that aside. And then Sunday morning, we're going to have our normal service at 9 and 1045 a.m. And uh, we have a lot of special things planned that day. One of the things I'm excited about that morning is Brother Walker's oldest son, Mark. He's going to be speaking for us. And I think that's, that's great. He'll have three of the four pastors of West Florida Baptist Church. He was a, a child in the, when it all started. And I think he's the perfect person that can bring it all together and really give us a great challenge. And so um, he's also currently running for governor of North Carolina. You're going to really enjoy Mark. He's an awesome guy. And so that's happening that Sunday morning. So we want you to set the dates and to mark your calendars. And why am I taking time? to talk about this at the beginning of every service as we get started from now until then. Because I told our church last week, and I want to remind you every week leading up to it, what we do in our 51st year is just as important as what we did as a church in our first year. The same faith that started at West Florida Baptist Church is the same faith that is required for God to continue to bless this church. And I want our church to have a new fire and a new zeal lit under us as we go into our 51st year about the great things that God can continue to do in and through West Florida Baptist Church. So that's one of the things I'm excited about today in our defining moments. But another thing I'm excited about this series is it fits perfectly with Father's Day. Dads. How many of you in here desire not just to build a lasting legacy, but to leave a lasting spiritual legacy? Man, I hope that is your heart's desire. I hope that's what burns inside of you. And this morning, Joshua chapter 11 provides us with the exact encouragement and motivation that we need. And that leads to the title of the message this morning, which you've already heard about. Hamish was talking about it. It is this, a mission accomplished. A mission accomplished. Joshua chapter 11, verse 23 says, So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. I want you to understand how monumental of a moment Joshua chapter 11, verse 23 is. Highlight it. Put a star by it. This is Hundreds of years of God's promises that he had given hundreds of years earlier finally coming to full fruition and something monumental and major that could only be attributed to God happened and took place right here in Joshua chapter 11. He gave his children the land that he had promised to them. Big accomplishment that's happening here. Has anyone ever heard of, all right, you ready for this? Has anyone ever heard of a, a BHAG? Nope, all of you are looking at me like this. Okay, a couple of you are shaking your heads. My brother Dave introduced this to me years ago. Once you hear it, you're never going to forget it. That's why I'm doing it today. Okay, here's what a BHAG is. Go ahead and put that slide up. It is A. Go ahead and put that slide up. <laughs> it's on there. I know it's coming. There it is. It is a big, hairy, audacious goal. Now, how many of you would say that is the weirdest thing you have ever heard in church in your entire life? And please don't repeat that too often, okay? I'll try my best to, to get by this, but I, I'm, I'm pointing this out for a reason, a purpose. That's something that's memorable. The second Dave told me what a BHAG was, I've never forgot it since. It's something that always is in the back of my mind. It comes from a book, a 1994 book. It's called Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. It was written by Jim Collins and Jerry Porras. And to simplify what this is, it is a long-term goal 
that everyone in the company can understand and rally behind. Now, how many of you would agree that conquering the promised land was a long-term goal that everybody could understand and that everybody could rally behind? This was a big, audacious goal. And here in Joshua chapter 11, it was completed. Man, I put myself in the shoes of these people that saw this come to fruition. Their entire lives had been built around accomplishing this goal. They grew up in the wilderness and they knew that they were gonna enter the promised land and here they are reaching the accomplishment of a huge milestone. Could you imagine how much rejoicing and how exciting that must have been for these people? You know, in just three weeks from today, we're gonna be celebrating our 50th anniversary. Do you know what it is that, that we talk about in the history of our church and what it is that's gonna be highlighted um, over the next few weeks, and especially on our anniversary Sunday, it's the accomplishment of the big goals. Man, I'm thankful for Brother Stewart. I'm thankful for Brother Walker. I'm thankful for the men of faith that they were. I was thinking about a couple of those this morning. In 1979, Stewart Street Baptist School, was it Stewart Street Baptist Christian School or Stewart Street Baptist? Yeah, Stewart Street Baptist Christian School opened its doors with an enrollment of 76 students, starting a Christian school. That's a big goal. That's a big, audacious goal, okay? When we open our doors in the fall of this year, right now we currently have an enrollment of right at 750 students. Will you praise the Lord for what God has done? Man, there's been many missions accomplished in the history of our school, but there are still big missions that we're pursuing and that we're after. I was also thinking this week about um, the purchase of the property. In 1988, our church moved from Stewart Street over here to Highway 90, and we changed the name from Stewart Street Baptist Church to West Florida Baptist Church and Academy. And uh, a couple weeks ago, when Brother Walker was here and Brother Stewart, and we were making a video for the 50th anniversary, he, Brother Walker just stood out there and talked about how there was absolutely nothing on Highway 90 back then. When they bought this property, it was completely woods, it was trees, it was just like what it is across the street. And as I drove into our property this morning, I saw a lot of disruption out front again as we're getting near the completion of a new road, as our property has doubled in size. And all I'm trying to point out is that it takes faith to move a church, to make a purchase, to make a giant move, to, to move from your existing property to a property that has absolutely nothing but trees on it, and it's gonna to continue to take faith as we continue to move forward. But all along the way, we are going to experience God being faithful to his promises and God moving and working and doing things that can only be attributed to him. And last week, we talked about the fact that nothing is impossible with God. And I don't know about you, but I wanna set some big goals in my life that only God can accomplish because we were created it for a purpose to bring glory to God in all that we say and do. And God desires nothing more than to show himself real in our lives and through our lives. And when we get a big vision, a faith-sized vision that he plants inside of our hearts and in our lives, then we will have all kinds of defining moments as we go through an experience, experiencing God deliver and mission after mission being accomplished for his honor and for his glory. This morning, I want us to see in this passage how faith is the key to unlocking a huge door of possibilities becoming reality. How many of you believe it takes great faith to step out there and to pursue big, audacious goals for God's honor and for God's glory? This passage, we see how faith is the very key that will unlock those door to possibilities. So let's just jump right into it. Number one, I want you to see this morning that faith has substance. Faith has substance. For sake of time, I'm not gonna go back and read verses one through three again, but Dave did do a good job reading. There was a lot of big names in there. And if you just look at the end of verse three, it talks about the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Hivites and all the ites that were in the land of Canaan. Have you ever stopped and wondered why the Bible includes portions of scripture like this with so many names and so many countries and so many different details? Why doesn't it just say that all the people 
in the northern land of Canaan, gathered themselves together, and they fought against Israel. Why does God go into the extreme record keeping of listing every king and every city? If you look at Joshua chapter 12, I'm going to cover it all right here. It lists out every single king and every single city that the nation of Israel went to and conquered in the promised land. Why does God do that? Because details matter. Details are important to God. And whenever you find a long list of genealogies or a long list of names, God's got an emphatic point that he wants to get across. And I believe here in this passage of scripture, you know what he's pointing out to us? The enormity of the enemy that they were up against. Man, do you grasp the enormity of the situation? I I don't know if you've noticed, but as we've gone through the book of Joshua, the enemy has only gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. This is another surprising lesson that I've learned as I've gone through the book of Joshua. You, you get into it, and the very first city that they come to is Jericho. And we know they marched around the wall seven days, and on the seventh day, seven times, and then the walls came tumbling down. And Jericho was a formidable city. It was a huge city, a double set of walls, impossible for the children of Israel to, to conquer that. Do you understand that was just one city? And that was just one nation? Here they have the entire northern region of the land of Canaan all joining forces together, coming up against the children of Israel. And look at what verse 4 says. And they went out, they and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude with horses and chariots very many. Let that sink in. The multitude was was too large to number. Everywhere they looked, there was people and the massive resources that were coming up against them. Horses and chariots. Listen, conquering the promised land, I believe is the greatest underdog story of all time. Everybody likes a good underdog story, right? Man, if we're gonna compare it to something, I I was thinking of Elon Musk and SpaceX, okay? You know what SpaceX has as their mission? (laughs) <laughs> to not only explore Mars, but to also, um, not only to explore Mars, but to settle on Mars and to have human people living on, on the planet of Mars. How many of you think that this, that sounds absolutely insane and like it's never gonna happen and take place? I feel that way personally. <laughs> That's a big audacious goal right there. Can I tell you that if you were to go around and talk about the nation of Israel conquering the promised land, it would sound just as bizarre and crazy You know what we're talking about here? We're talking about the children of slaves. We're talking about an entire generation that was raised in the wilderness. Man, here they are in this passage. They're going to go up against horses and chariots with swords on foot. That would be just as crazy as going into modern war and going up against tanks and armored vehicles with a machine gun. Who's going to win that battle? You understand they are completely and totally outmarched, but God once again gives a victory that can only be attributed to him. And I want you to understand right off the bat that faith has substance. Faith has substance. God's power to save is no empty metaphor. We just got done listening to the choir singing about how awesome our God is, how mighty and how powerful and how wonderful he is. And those aren't just mere words. It is a reality and it is truth and nothing can stop the Lord Almighty. And when we step out in faith, oh, God will meet us there and he will prove over and over again that he is who he says he is. So here's a practical application this morning. Grow your faith. Grow your faith. You don't accomplish a goal like conquering the promised land unless you believe it's possible. And maybe you're here this morning and and maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, man, I'm not quite there yet, okay? I'm not like, you know, Joshua and the nation of Israel, that's some pretty big, amazing faith. That's not for me. Can I tell you how to grow your faith? Do little things like they're big things. Do little things like they're big things. I was encouraged this week as I was studying, I came across Zechariah chapter four. In Zechariah chapter four, Zerubbabel, he goes back to the promised land. This is hundreds of years after where we're at now. The children of Israel disobeyed God. They got led away into Babylonian captivity. And after 70 years, they come back to the promised land and Zerubbabel goes after a big audacious goal. He's going to rebuild the temple of God. 
And in Zechariah chapter 4, you know what they do? They lay the foundation in the temple. And there was, they laid the foundation in the midst of enemy opposition. They laid the foundation in the midst of criticism from God's own people saying, Psh, this is just a small work. This thing pales in comparison to what the temple used to be. And I think sometimes criticism from God's own people is more discouraging than even the criticism and the attacks that come from the outside enemy. And you know what God shows up and says? Do not despise thou the day of small beginnings. Do not despise thou the day of small beginnings. All Zerubbabel did was lay the foundation. All he did was take the first step. All he did was step out by faith in the midst of opposition and in the midst of criticism and believe and trust that God was going to deliver on his promises. And do you know who was there on day number one cheering him on and encouraging him in the work? God Almighty himself, whose eyes run to and fro throughout all the earth. He sees every detail, and every little detail matters. And all I'm trying to tell you this morning you grow your faith by doing little things like they're big things. Dads, if you want to build a lasting spiritual legacy, do the little things like they're big things. Read your Bible. Maybe some of you dads need to commit to spending time in God's word. Be faithful to church. Maybe you need to start praying with your children. Maybe you need to start spending time in prayer with your wife. Hey, maybe when you come to church, you need to, to start singing, or maybe you do sing, and maybe, maybe as we're singing those songs that we were singing about today, it is finished, maybe something inside of you wants to raise your hand, but, but you feel a little fearful, or maybe you want to say amen, but you feel a little fearful. Listen, just take those next steps of faith. Let God begin to work in you and through you and follow God, and don't despise the day of small beginnings, because every time you step out by faith, and you obey God and you follow him, he will meet you there with his unbelievable power and you will discover that faith has substance. It's not just blind faith. Do little things like they're big things. Grow your faith. Secondly, I want you to see this morning that faith will endure. Not only does faith have substance, but faith will endure. Look at verse 18 of Joshua chapter 11. Everybody look at verse 18. It says this, Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. Does anybody want to take a guess at how long it took them to conquer the promised land? Anybody want to take a guess? Go ahead, call out a number. Years. 10 years, thank you. 20 years. Man, you guys are good. I was actually shocked at how long it took. It took them seven years to conquer the promised land. Now, the reason why I was shocked is if, if you sit down and you read Joshua chapter 1 through 11, you could probably read it in about 30 to 40 minutes at the most, and you would be under the impression that it was just a couple battles, and I mean, they were big battles, but I mean, the Jericho took seven days, and then they just went right into AI, and it's just like the sequence of events, and you could almost walk away with the impression that it was just a quick couple of months, and they had taken over the promised land, but it was not that. It was seven long Years of war. Remember the two and a half tribes that left their families and their, um, and their, their, their families and all of their livestock on the other side of the Jordan River? For seven years, their husbands and fathers were away fighting battle in the promised land. How many of you would agree that that would be some long, grueling, daunting years? Was God working? Yes. But he was working in a way that calls for endurance and tenacity and staying with it in the fight. And this is such an accurate picture of life because you know what life is? Life is a battle. Life is a grind. Is there anybody here this morning that just is tired of fighting? And I don't necessarily mean like fighting in a bad way, but just fighting. I don't know about you. I get, sometimes we get weary and well-doing, Right? We get worn out, and life is just a constant grind, and you get one victory over here, but guess what? As soon as you accomplish that victory, there's other battles that are still waiting for you. That's a great picture of what life is. It took them seven years to conquer the promised land, but they endured because faith will endure. So how do we endure? i got to show you a couple quick things. I'm going to go through the first two really quick because we've already talked a lot about them through the series, but look at verse 6. It says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, 
Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hew their horses and burn their chariots with fire. You know the first thing that we need to do if we're going to endure? We need to renew. We need to renew our faith in God. How many times have we seen God show up to Joshua and say, be not afraid, I will deliver them into your hands. I am so thankful that we serve a God who is patient enough to remind us of the same truths over and over and over again. Because even though they experience great victories, just like you and I experience great victories, you ever run into the next battle and you're like, oh no, here we go again. How am I gonna get through this? Renew your faith. Every day, his mercies are new and fresh. Every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Renew your faith in God. Go back to his word. Go back to his promises over and over again. Second thing, how we endure, is we fight. Look at verse seven. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Merim suddenly, and they fell upon them. You know what we're called to do as believers? Not to just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. Our faith requires action. We gotta get in the fight. We can't sit on the sidelines. We can't retreat. We can't let fear paralyze us. We've gotta fight. Dads, can I encourage you to keep fighting the good fight? Get in the battle. Fight for your families. Fight for your children. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your testimony. Fight for your relationship with God. Fight for your neighbor. Fight for your lost family member. Fight to accomplish living out the glory of God in your lives because there's no greater calling and there's nothing worth fighting for more than that. Get in the fight. Man, you stop fighting. You stop fighting and the enemy's gonna come in and have a heyday. There's nothing there. Get in the fight. And last is obey. So how do we endure? We renew, we fight, and we obey. (laughs) This is what I really want you to see from this passage this morning. You know what obedience does? Obedience disarms. Look at verse 9. It says, And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hewed their horses, and he burnt their chariots with fire. Okay, so the night before, he said, go up and fight. And when you do, one of the things I want you to do is I want you to hew their horses and I want you to burn their chariots with fire. And Joshua obeyed. Verse nine tells us about the completion of this. There are two things that you've got to see. Number one is obedience disarms. If you look back in verse seven, it says that Joshua came upon them suddenly. How many times have we seen quick sneak attacks and the military advantage that it gave to the children of Israel? We've seen that over and over again. Because you know what? Joshua is the epitome of I will obey right away. (laughs) Instant obedience. And you know what instant obedience does? It disarms the enemy. Now, you might be thinking, how in the world could the nation of Israel go up against chariots and horses? Do you know where he attacked them? In the Valley of Gerzim. You know where that was? That was 4,000 feet above sea level at the top of a mountain in Upper Galilee. And where he caught them was in a place where they could not use their horses and they could not use their chariots. And because they obeyed instantly right away, it put the enemy at a complete disadvantage, disadvantage and they went in and they got the victory. Can I tell you a truth? that we as believers need to know and understand, when you obey God right away, Satan can't do anything with that. Oh, when we delay in our obedience, oh yeah, that opens up the door, a crack for him to get into our minds and our thinking, but when we obey right away, it disarms the enemy and it puts him at the defensive and we move on in victory, accomplishing things that can only be attributed to God. So obedience disarms, but also obedience disables. Does anybody think that it was not that great of a military decision to hew the horses? So anybody want to know what that means? Anyone curious about hewing their horses? It basically means they hamstrung the horses. They went in and they, they cut their hamstrings and they disabled the horses. Now, that sounds awful and cruel, okay? And it also is like you're disabling the old-fashioned back in those days tanks, <laughs> and the, the power that could go out. So as smart as the military decision was to attack suddenly up there where they disarmed the enemy, here this sounds like a really bad military decision. Why would you burn the chariots and why would you disable the horses when you could add them to your own fleet and you could become a more powerful army? You know what the answer is? God told them to. God told them to. For whatever reason, God did not want his people, he does not want us to become reliant upon our resources, our strength, 
our power. He wants us to be relying on something much greater and bigger than any of that, and that is the Lord Almighty. His power is greater, and he is able. And so he told them, destroy the weapons that you could use because you have something greater than horses and chariots. You have me. Here's the reality. Sometimes we look at obedience as it hamstringing us. Have you ever looked at obedience that way? Like it hamstrings us? I was thinking about giving this morning. Does God want us to give to him? He does, man. When I was a a high schooler going into college, I did not want to tithe and give because it felt like it was hamstringing me. It made no sense. I got to pay for my own college. Every penny I make, I've already spent it, plus some. How am I supposed to give back to God and have enough to meet all of my needs? And it feels like it hamstrings you, but it's the exact opposite. When we obey and when we give and when we trust God, he doesn't need our money. All it does is it opens up the windows of heaven where God can pour out blessings on our lives. How about loving others? Does loving others ever feel like it hamstrings you? I can't remember the last time somebody called me up and said, hey, Pastor Mike, I need some help. And I need it at Saturday at 10 o'clock. And I'll say, you know what? Saturday at 10 o'clock, I had penciled into my schedule four hours of just complete availability to help others. Has anybody ever had that happen? (laughs) When we have to help others, it normally comes at the most inconvenient time possible, right? And it feels like it's hamstringing you because there's other things that could be done and getting accomplished. It does not hamstring us. It opens up the windows of heaven. When we obey God, it enables his power to work in us and through us for his honor and for his glory. Man, if we're going to endure, we got to get a hold of renew, fight, and obey. And get hungry about obeying God. I was thinking about my dog this morning. We're dog people. Had a dog for, what, six weeks now? We love this dog, man. He was the gift. We didn't even know we needed. One of the things about our dog is about, I think it's so funny, about 30 minutes to an hour before it's time for him to eat, he goes and he lays right by our bowl, and he just is so pathetic. He puts his face there, and he's so hungry, and he's ready for us to feed him. And one of the things is our kids have all been trying to train him to do different things. We got him to sit. We got him to shake. That's about it. We're working on other things. He's just a dog, and he just is a part of the family, all right? But we try. But what is so funny is when, it, when it's time to eat, okay, when it's time for us to go over there, we don't like him hovering over that bowl where we can't even dump the food in, so we got to get him in a spot, and we make him sit. This is hilarious. He is willing to obey any command that we've ever taught him. As we tell him to sit, he doesn't just sit. He lifts his paw up. He's like, hey, I'll sit. I'll shake. I'll roll over. I'll shake both paws. I'll do a little dance. I'll do whatever you want to. Just feed me. I was thinking about him this morning. When it comes to obeying God, that should be exactly our response. Man, we should be hungry for his power. We should be hungry for him doing things that only he can do to the point where if God says, go, we go. If he says, stop, we stop. Whatever it is, God, I'll do it because I know that something awesome is coming on the other side. I'm going to be fed by you. I'm going to be given your strength, your power, your peace, whatever it is that we need. Faith endures. Because faith obeys like it believes that God's going to open the windows of heaven and enable us to do what what only he can do and to accomplish great things for his honor and for his glory. Last but not least is this, faith finds rest. Faith finds rest. Look at verses 19 and 20. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All other they took in battle. Look at verse 20. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. Here's a practical application. Make peace with God. I want to give you a warning, every single person in here this morning. Make peace with God. Why did these cities not make peace with the children of Israel? Because God hardened their hearts. And why did God harden their hearts? Because he wanted to destroy them utterly. You might be sitting here and you might be saying, wow, who gave God the right to do that? God is God. And he is sovereign. And when we come across passages of scripture like this, 
We just need to pause for a minute and, and let that sink in. He can do what he wants, how he wants, when he wants to. I also want to point out something else that so often we look over. Do you understand back in Genesis chapter 15, when God was making the promise to Abraham that he would give him all the land to his descendants, he told him back then, not for four generations, Abraham, not for 400 years, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. For 400 years, God gave these people opportunity to repent and to believe and to put their faith and trust in him, but they did not. And finally, God, who is just and who is righteous and who is holy, saw that they were never going to repent, and he hardened their hearts to destroy them utterly because someday judgment day is coming, and the warning that we all have to take heed to is make peace with God while you can. We are the enemies of God. We're born into this world sinners, but Jesus Christ went to a cross, and on that cross, he bridged the gap between God and man, and if we believe and put our faith and trust in him, we can find rest in a relationship with God, and we, he will be our father, and we will be his children, and he will pour out his blessings on our lives, but we've got to make peace with God, and that can only happen through Jesus Christ. Faith finds rest. Make peace with God. That's not your enemy. That's not who you want to fight against. He is a good, loving, heavenly father, the best father you could ever ask for in your life. Make peace with God. And last but not least, see the chains. Look at verse 21. It says, and at that time, Joshua came and cut off the Anakims from the mountains. Let's skip down to the end of the verse. It says, Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod there remain. Anybody know who the Anakims are? The Anakims are a nation of giants. Remember back 40 years earlier when Joshua and Caleb and the other 10 spies went into the promised land? One of the things that they saw were giants. You know, the um, Anakims were an entire army of incredible hawks that lived in the promised land. Remember I told you at the beginning that the enemies keep getting bigger and bigger? He saves the best for last, and it's almost anticlimactic. He doesn't even put a big emphasis on it, because by the time you get to victory after victory after victory, you come up to an army of incredible hawks, and you say, my God is greater and bigger, and you just knock out the giants like they're nothing. Do you understand? In our life, we're faced with giants, right? We talk about those cliches at church all the time. What giant do you have standing in your way? What's facing you this week? I know you have obstacles. I know that there's big things out there that are in front of you, but our God is greater and our God is bigger. You know what faith does? Faith sees the change. How many of you ever read the book Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan? It's a religious allegory about the Christian life. One of the scenes in the book is Christian is heading to um, the house beautiful, and in order to get there, he's got to go to the porter's house. And he's got to walk down this, this really narrow path. And along the path are these big, giant lions. How many of you think you would think twice about walking down the path where there's big lions that are in the way? That's the allegory of life. When we're headed towards God, guess what? We've got an enemy, right? Our enemy is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. John Bunyan adds this absolutely phenomenal line in there. He said he saw the lions, but he did not see the chains. Go ahead and put this picture up. I think this picture here gives us an awesome reality of what the power of God, his sovereignty is really like. Yes, there's an enemy. Yes, there's a roaring lion walking about whom and seeking whom he may devour. But can I tell you that he is chained by the sovereign power of our omnipotent God. And you know what faith does? Faith doesn't just see the enemy. Faith doesn't just see the obstacle. Faith sees the chains. Faith sees our God that is greater and bigger than any obstacle that stands in our way. And no matter what big goal that we're chasing after in life, whether it's just to be a godly dad and raise godly children, can I tell you, that is a huge goal. Everything in this world is working against you, but everything in this world is chained by the power of our sovereign God. And faith finds rest. We can go through life poised. We can go through life confident. We can go through life victorious, not because there's anything good about us, but because there's everything good about our God. What big goal are you after in life? I was thinking a lot about that this week. You know what? I I don't know if there's an exact answer 
that you have in this moment today, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this challenge to heart. What big, audacious goal are you after and are you pursuing in your life for the glory of God? By the way, this isn't something that's just for the younger generation that's coming up. This is something for every single person in here, even our older folks that are getting closer to the end of your life. What are you chasing? What are you pursuing for God? How can you impact the next generation that's coming up? This is for all of us. He doesn't want us to waste. I'm afraid that so often we just come and we attend church and we listen to messages, but are we really in the fight on our day-to-day basis? Are we living for ourselves or are we living for God? What are we chasing after? What are we pursuing? I'm telling you, as we go into our 51st year, I'm gonna ask you to pray for our church. Our staff is meeting this Thursday and Friday. We're having some church planning meetings. And one of the things we're gonna be talking about are some of the, the big audacious goals that our church can pursue over the next 10 years long-term goals that we can rally behind. And I'm excited about introducing some of them as we go through our 51st year because we serve a big God. I don't want to go through life not experiencing that.